In Psalms, the first chapter and the ninth chapter in Isaiah 54, you may read all of the chapters when you get home. There are too many educated people that listen to this broadcast and present here that know American history and ancient history, Roman history, and world history. For me to mention things that are not true. In Psalms chapter 2 and verse 1, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The K I N G S, kings, a lot of them, many of them, plural. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, or against the Bible, or against the scriptures, whichever term would suit you best. We can't mention all of them, there are too many. One of the great countries of the world and one of the first civilizations was the great country of Egypt. The man came to power there that ruled out God and God's people and all of the sacrifices and everything else. His name was Pharaoh. And he was warned and warned and warned, and so to speak, laughed and laughed and laughed. And a bunch of feeble people moved into his country called the Hebrews or the Jews. And uh, he decided that he would do away with them, annihilate them. And so when the older king had died and the other young king came to the throne, he set out to destroy God's word and God's people. And the end of the council was, of course, God told him to kill a lamb and put the blood on either side of the doorpost. God brought judgment to that king, and look where Egypt is today. That's number one. Egypt today is one of the lesser nations for power, finance, food, and everything else. We have had to feed them for the last 25 years, practically so. That's the great country of Egypt. All of its large buildings and towers and ship docks and whatnot have gone. God sent old Jonah the prophet into a city called Nineveh. The Bible said it took you three days to walk across it. It was a large city and on the sea coast, and the people became so vain and wicked and vile against God and what few Christians there were there. God told Jonah, the old Jewish prophet, to go over and preach to it. Jonah went and preached to it, and they repented, but they soon forgotten. And a hundred years later, when it had gone back into all of its sin, God destroyed it almost to the word of how he said he would, though he stayed it for a hundred years. And today all you find is a few big old columns standing much larger than these white posts, and uh, one or two old fishermen's huts up and down that great coast there, but the city is all gone. Babylon, no doubt, was the greatest city ever known, greater than New York City today, London, England, Paris, France, or uh, anywhere you want to mention. San Francisco, I'll just mention any of them, but... This great city of Babylon was by and far greater with silver and gold and everything else. So they took the gold and they made gods out of them, and they made gods out of silver, and they'd worship these as their idols. They were idol-worshiping people, the Babylonians were, and so they worshiped idols, and they named them and gave them great names and so on and on. And uh, the old prophet told them what would happen, and uh, he said that your gods can't help you. So I want to read from Psalms 46. One of their gods' name was Bel, the other was Nebo, says, Bel boweth down, Nebo stoopeth, their idols were upon the beast, and upon the cattle your carriages were heavy laden, <clears throat> their burden to the very beast. They stoop, they bow down together, they could not deliver thee, but themselves are gone into captive. Hearken unto me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel, which are born by me from the belly. And even to your old age, I am, and even to the hoary frost of your hire will I have made. I will carry and will deliver you. To whom would you liken me, this is God speaking, and make me equal and compare me? They lavish gold out of the bag, weigh silver in the balance, and hire a goldsmith, and he maketh it a god. They fall down, yea, they worship him. They bear him up on their shoulders, they carry him, and set him in his place, and he standeth from his place. Shall he not remove, yea? One shall cry unto him, yet he cannot answer, nor save him out of his trouble, and so on and on. And so this great country, when they turned to idols, God called a man's name a hundred years before he was born, and said, He'll come, 
And he was born, and God called his name Cyrus. And a hundred years before he was born, God called his name. He let him be born, and he grew up to be a king, and he came and took this place, and there's no Babylon left today. When you go there now as a world traveler, you can't get an Arab. There's, there's not an Arab in the world will stay, you, stay with you in Babylon when the sun goes down, not one. When the sun goes down, you may have an Arab guide, and when the sun starts to go down, he'll leave Babylon and he'll leave it in a hurry. It's ruins now. And uh, uh, after the sun goes down, travelers who stay there, you'll see these old scorpions come and you can see their eyes. They'll shine at you in the night. And, 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 and the Arabs will flee, and God said he would make it a place of screeching and scorpions and so on. And so no, no Arab guide will stay with you in the ruins of Babylon when the sun goes down. And I repeat, it was far greater than any known city today. It had its water, it had its food, it had its everything. But they took these, these idols and they fell down to worship idols. And so God called his man and raised him up and waited a hundred long years and then brought judgment. That's the greatest city. When the Bible speaks of cities today, it calls them Babylon. It means like unto the great Babylon yonder, where God has destroyed that the Arabs will not go with you there when the sun goes down as a guide. They'll stay with you till about half hour of the sun, then they'll leave you. Where is Babylon today? Where is it at? So let's take right on down through. China today is starving, and they don't care how many die. They don't try to keep them from dying. The more die, the more is left for the rest of them. That's China. Look at Japan today with no God. Look at Russia. And just on the radio, there's some other names I'd like to call. Probably wouldn't be the best. But look where they are. Well, let's step down a little closer. People who thought that they could take America because we believed in God and prayed. 1917, 18, my brother went off to war, as did many of our brothers and some of your dads and so on. This little country of ours was small, but our forefathers met here to pray. And they met here for one purpose, to seek God where they could worship. So Germany thought they could take us in 1917, 18. You know what happened. Read the history. And so on down. So in 19 and 41 and through that, Russia and Italy together thought they could take us. But you see what happened. Now, it will depend on how many people in America stay close to God. The ruling of nine men, I repeat, eight men, one of the men refused to take side. The Supreme Court of our United States ruled that, that because this atheist woman and her son hollered and said, I don't want my son exposed to the Bible and to the story of God, they ruled that she was right. I'm so glad for our own superintendent, Mr. Essex, who said we're going to read the Bible here anyhow. I'm glad our county superintendent said we're going to read the Bible anyhow. Let me tell you something. The time has come when you, for yourself, as a lone individual, you're going to have to stand in the Goodyear, Farstone, Goodrich, service station, drugstore, grocery store. You're going to have to stand up and be counted as a Christian, or what will happen? You'll be counted with the other crowd. And God knows your heart. Now, he said here, the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, and against his anointed sin, God let a little baby boy, a Jewish boy by the name of Moses, be born. And this Egypt said, we'll get rid of him. We know how to do it. Why, we'll just have him kill all of the babies that's born. That's easy done. So all the boy babies will be killed. Yes, I know. Moses had a praying mother and some praying sisters. And so the mother said, I don't care what the king said. I'm going to keep this baby boy because God put it in her heart and taught her how to do it. So she hid him for three months till he got to where he could cry, and she put him in his little basket and set him out on the water. God used the cry of that baby boy and the cry of that mother to save the Hebrew race at that time. So we we'll have to hurry along. Jeremiah, a fearless prophet, he preached against the kings and kingdoms and sin of the day. And so while he was up preaching one day and, and reading the scrolls and the men of God ahead of him, one of the cabinet members came and took it. This is in the Bible. This is not history. This is in the book of Jeremiah. And he took his pen knife. He uses the same word we use today. And he took his pen knife and he cut his sermon all to pieces. And the scroll and let it fall down at his feet. And they picked it up and burned it in the fire. And Jeremiah said, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something now. If this does not come to pass, then I'm not God's man. But if it does, and so it did come to pass, all he had said. They took the old prophet, they put him down with his feet in the stocks, and it cost him something, but if every word came true. Now then, God said, you listen, this is not what Dallas, but the kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed sayings, or his Bible of the Scripture. Let us break their bands asunder, cast away their cords from us. 
They're saying, let us break the bands of the Scripture. We don't need these. Then the fourth verse, he that sitteth in the heavens shall lie. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak to them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Be wise now, therefore, O you kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Be instructed in what? In God's Bible. Be wise, O you kings, and be you instructed, you judges of the earth. Life's a pretty short journey. I'll soon have all of my days. If, if I get every day, God promises me there can't be many left now. And that's true of every judge. That's true of every king. You say, don't you believe in the Constitution of the United States? One part of it I've said from the day I was in school. I, I've got people still living. I'm not bragging about this. I'll just show you that I've been a man of my own thinking since I was a kid in school. We had a debate back in school. When I was 10 years old, I was debating two boys, 16 years old. Another boy and I. This is a fair record and can be proven. Go to school at Murray, Kentucky, right out east of Murray. Go see and I debated then, I said, I'll never believe, I never will believe that nine men should be elected and never can be taken from their place. I don't believe that. I think anybody ought to have a right to remove him. I don't care who he is, that's me. I don't care who they are. That's the mayor, that's the judge, that's anybody. I never have believed that men should be elected to office until death. I don't believe that. That's as American citizen. The Supreme Court is supposed to be a judicial bench, not a legislative bench. I studied law enough to embarrass good lawyers. I studied medicine enough to embarrass Dr. Wharton back here and the other doctors. But I like to read the book and ask some embarrassing questions. Congress, what's known as the House of Representatives and Senate, are to make the laws. And then, if some question comes up, the Supreme Court is to interpret that law, but not to make one. My father said when I was a kid, the day will come when the, it's my opinion, he said, when the Supreme Court of the United States will become a legislative body, not a judicial body. They'll be making laws to suit themselves by misinterpreting the law. We've got a law that says freedom of speech and freedom of religion. It's been left like that for some hundred and... 75 years, and now somebody comes along and takes each word of it and interprets it to make it say this or say that, which the legislative body and our forefathers never planned it that way, but some smart people get together and they interpret and make it say what the forefathers did not plan for it to say, perhaps, just a man's opinion or eight or nine men's opinion. Oftentimes, the Supreme Court bench is split four and five. How can four men be wrong just because they have an odd one on the other side? Let me tell you something now. America, when you take God out of your thinking, you go back to the days of Egypt. When you take God out of your thinking, your school will go back. And like I told the Akron Beacon Journal, we'll go back to hedonism. What's hedonism? Running naked, they're doing that now on the streets of Akron. We're not for the law, there'd be thousands of them, didn't have anything on, but the law requires so they wrap up a little spot up. No smiles, please. No smiles. We'll go back to running naked on the streets and drunk in the bar rooms and drunk on the streets and raping our women and killing our girls when you take God out of it. That's where you'll go back to. That's where we're going to now. We're not planning to go. We're on a road now. Right now. So, oh, I know if Dallas Spoon was saying this, you'd get awfully mad, but it won't do you any good. The wicked... I'm reading from Psalms, the book of God, that they try to do away with. Chapter 9, verse 70. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations, that's plural, got an S on the end of it, Egypt, China, Japan, anywhere else, and America. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all nations that forget God. You don't have to curse God, just forget Him. We'll run America without him. We'll run the ships without him. 126 men laying in the bottom of the ocean now down there. And the submarine, they'll die. That's their grave. They're there now. They'll probably be there forever. Why? I don't know why. I'm not allowed to say on a broadcast. If I was off of it, I'd tell you why. A man falls 15,000 feet and his feet hits the water and breaks his ankles. 
instead of him saying, thank God I'm still alive, he says, it's a hell of a way for a man to die seeing it coming right up in your face. God help a man that would be delivered from a 15,000 foot fall and then curse God because he didn't kill him when he hit the water. Don't you have any reason? Don't you have any sense? I'm glad the Bible said, and Dallas don't have to say it, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. The fool said that, not a wise man. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Who made that little watch? Who made that microphone? Who made that church view? Who made this church? Who made this world and its mountains and its water? The fool said there's no God. A wise man wouldn't say it. An idiot might say it, but no smart man would say it. America just didn't happen to be. Some people landed here with a Bible. They crossed that ocean in a little old ship I would want to cross Lake Erie over to Detroit with their families. And God let them land. They opened the Bible. They read the Bible. My forefathers, when they discovered America, they were not looking for silver and gold. They were looking for a place to worship God in spirit and in truth. Those who discovered South America were looking for gold. Where's South America? Still in the jungles and still living naked. And still he is. Not us. We came here to read God's Bible and to believe and to teach our people to be saved. Aren't you afraid of them, Dallas? No. Never crosses my mind. It ought to be. No, you're wrong. Why? I will not be afraid of what ten thousands of people can do to me, says the Word of God. Never worries me. Never crosses my mind. Why? I'll show you. I'll read it to you out of the Bible. Never crosses my mind. I slept a pretty good night's sleep for three hours last night, if that's long enough. I guess it is for a man my age. I'm reading from the book of God, the old prophet Isaiah, chapter 54 and verse 15. Behold, they shall surely gather together, but not by me. Whosoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. Behold, I have created the smith, and he that bloweth the coals in the fire, and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work. And I have created the waster to destroy. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Four thousand long years went by. One day in heaven's glory, planned by the prophets, to pick a place, God told him, forewarned, and God sent his own son into this world. And when his son came into the world, the kings and the rulers got together and they said, you know what this is? This is God's son. The Bible says they told that, they knew that. And so again, the same proclamation that failed with Moses went out again to kill all of the baby boys from this date of birth when we think he was born up until he's two years old so kill him get rid of him that's what the bible means when it said we hear rachel weeping and crying weeping and mourning for her children and would not be comforted because they were not the word israel of course rachel weeping means the house of the jews and so they killed every jew boy they could get a hold of again trying to find the lord jesus christ and to kill him Slipped across the border into Egypt, and then later he said, Out of Egypt have I called my son. They didn't see him anymore till 12 years old when he walked in to the council yonder in his own little hometown of Bethlehem, where he was brought up at. And there they began to see the great and mighty hand and power of God upon the Jewish boy called Christ, who was God's son, who escaped every one of the proclamations against him. He fades again until he's 30 years old, and we see him baptized. Then he said, I'm God's son. God sent me to die on a cross to save you from your sin. I'm God's son. I was born to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. I'm a Hebrew. I'm your own son. I'm your own son. I will one day sit upon my father's throne, but I am now the Savior. I'm the Christ. I'm the Lamb of God. And what happened? Three and a half short years and four unfair trials, and they nailed his hands to the cross. But before that happened, the song that Joe sang, the devil tried to drown him to keep him from the cross. He offered him the world for the mind. And now then, 
against Christ and his anointed sins. We go out yonder to the cemeteries and we look there at the dirt that's fallen in and we'll say, O grave, where is thy victory? And O death, where is thy sting? And Jesus said, One day I'm coming back again. And this atheist woman who used to live in Akron said, I don't believe in Jesus Christ. I don't believe in his son. I don't believe in God. And I'll sue and stop the Bible from being read in the public school. I'm one woman and my son, and we don't want to be contaminated with the name of God. And eight of our judicial judges say she's right. Who built America? Christians built America. God's people built America. Praying people built America. Good doctors are Christian doctors. Good scientists say the Bible and science agree. But here's the rabble rousers. Oh, I see. That's not the best name for him, I don't guess, Dr. Billingdon. Shouldn't call him that. Should call him Dr. Broadmouth. Or some other name. But I'll show you what God said about him. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints, not to the devil's prayer. For thou art certain men crept in unaware, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ, the book of Jude. If you don't have a hope in God, God have pity on your soul. If you're trying to raise a baby without God, God have mercy on you. If you're trying to run a business without God, God have pity on you. I have a letter in the office to be published in the paper. A businesswoman in the state of Michigan said we were partners in a big restaurant. And we were going broke and our partner demanded his pay. And on Mother's Day, somebody gave me the book you wrote, God is Real. I started to read the book. I kept reading the book. We had no money for the finances, so we started to do exactly what the book God is Real, which is all Bible, with the exception of a few comments. We read the book, we took the book God is Real, and did just exactly what you all did at the church. And a man loaned us the money, and we bought out the other half of the restaurant and said our business is double since we took God to be our partner. We're going to publish it. Oh, let me tell you something. I want two, three minutes and show you <clears throat> can't call names <clears throat> excuse me let's take a supreme judge or any judge or any lawyer or any prosecutor or any doctor or any preacher or any one of you out there with a third grade education and common sense and stand you all on this side let's take a boy that's gone naked all of his life and he's 35 years old let's take an old man that's 60 never had anything but a lawn cloth on and stand him over here and death comes now death comes now and here's some lawyers and judges and preachers and religious leaders not saved. And here stands a bunch over here. Fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, an old man with silver hair. Never wore clothes. And the only thing he ever knew about God is a guilty conscience. The more that this supreme judge or any judge knows about the civil law, the more he'd have to know about God's law. See what I mean? The more it happens. The more you know about God, if you die unsaved, the deeper you'll go in hell. And the more trouble you'll have in hell. There is judgments, diverse judgments in hell, the same as there's rewards in heaven. And if a man dies who was smart enough to be a lawyer, a doctor, or a preacher, or something, and he never got saved, he'll go far deeper in his punishment, far greater than the old man over yonder with his little loincloth on that went naked all of his life and died at the same age because he didn't know any better. He didn't know any better. But a man who's smart enough to be a lawyer, doctor, preacher, and get up and talk to people, and he goes through the pages of this book and he dies, conscience. I remember that invitation. I remember the broadcast when I laughed at the preacher. I remember when I called him a radical. I remember all these things. But what will you remember when he says, Thou shalt guff it divides, and I'll beg not for a drink of water. I only want a drop to cool my tongue. No! You said that man was low down. Send him to the penitentiary. Send him to the chair. Do this and do that. You wore the black robe. You wore it. How about now? I'm talking about unsaved only, and I don't know who they are. Memory. Haunted memories. What's a little short life of 70 short years? God cuts the thread of life like a wedge falling into a dark abyss of hell. 
begging where there's no friends now, and God's the judge, the true judge. The Savior you laughed at, the anointed one, the Son of God, the Rose of Sharon, the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, the Mighty Counselor, the coming Christ, he will wear the white robe. He will be a righteous judge. He will judge the poor man and the rich man, the wicked and the old will act together. Don't you worry. The man that's never accepted Christ as Savior and looked upon the bloody face and the nail-scarred hands and the ribbon side will be lost. Lost, lost, lost for a million years. And think of a man with a college education with all the books he's read and all the time he took the Bible and threw it aside, ruled it out of the schools. Congress will have it ruled out of there. You watch and see if they get by ruled out of the schools. A congressman, you know, has a chaplain. They have a Bible. I was there and saw him read it. But if they can take it out of the school, they'll take it out of Congress. There'll be no Bible. God have pity on America. God have pity on America. Sorrow, trouble, bloodshed, killing each other. FBI tracking them down like bloodhounds. Communists creeping into our own crowd, into our churches, and men creeping unaware. And they get in pulpits, and they get on the judges' bench. They get everywhere. God said they would. I've read it from the Bible. And I still have free speech in America in the state. You go on now and go to hell. If the light don't go out, I'd like to say to every man listening, you die unsaved, and you're the man I'm talking about. If you're saved, I didn't mean you. God didn't mean you. You die unsaved, I don't care what title you hold on or You'll be in hell forever. No one's going to pray you out and buy you out and get you out. You'll be in hell as long as God lives. Shall we bow our heads? Radio Land, if you'd ask the Lord, he'd save you. Right by your radio. Pray a sinner's prayer. God forgive him and save him. He will right before you are. Father, our heads are bowed. The light's out now.